My name's Sky Blackburn and I beat the often path by farming edible insects. Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast. I'm your host, Ross Palmer. On this show, I showcase unusual success stories to help us think outside the box in our lives and careers and to radically redefine what success means because I don't believe that success should just mean made a ton of money. Well, today I've got such a cool guest on the show. Sky Blackburn has made an enormous impact in her native Australia with a truly innovative idea. She combined a lifelong passion for insects with a degree in food science to create a groundbreaking edible insect company. Today, she's educated and advocated for this all over her country. She's educated over a million people about the future of food and the importance of adding new sources like insects to our diets, not just for fun, but for the survival of our species. Her products are already in grocery stores, and her insect farms are a marvel of AI, solar power, and just general awesomeness. She's proof that the thing that makes you strange might just be your greatest asset. I can't wait for you to hear the tale of Sky Blackburn, founder of Circle Harvest. Farming edible insects. Now, everybody, when they're a kid, that's the first thing that they think of. That's what I thought. When I was four years old, I said, when I grow up, I'm going to farm edible insects. Did you have that, too? No, definitely not. <laughs> you, you didn't? It came much later. No, it was completely wow. by accident. So. I thought every child had that as their goal. But you know what? When I was a kid, I was that, um, you know, the wee kid that had little bugs on their desk at school. And, um, you know, I'd be fascinated by all the creepy crawly things. I'd be in the bush going out catching um, like scorpions and um, uh, praying mantises and stick insects and things like that. So when I went to university, obviously I wanted to study entomology because I was a big bug nerd. But there's not really a lot of jobs in entomology in Australia. Um, so actually did a degree in food science at the same time because as most food scientists will know you like to have things a certain way and that fit in really well with my personality um so I accidentally ended up with a degree in food science and entomology um and a couple of years later I actually started my own business farming insects for human consumption incredible so I've got to ask Steve Irwin he was hugely popular in my childhood was that was he popular in your neck of the woods or not yeah, so he's Australian, so right. obviously, like, he's super popular here, and he is still super popular. Um, when I was a, a little hero. kid, um, my mum used to get me, like, VHS tapes um, that had, like, National Geographic documentaries about bugs in South Africa yeah. and places like that. Um, yeah, so definitely Steve Irwin was the t on the top of my list of one of the, um, the nature wranglers that I was watching at the time. So as a kid, you're inspired by the work that he was doing, because we... Growing up in the middle of nowhere in America, we're just so inspired by a show like that. It was so foreign to us going out in nature and wrestling with crocodiles, all of that <laughs> stuff. I lived in a very suburban town that had a single bowling alley and nothing going on. There was no nature to speak of. There were some mountains far away. But watching that, I've always admired that aspect of the Australian spirit, the willingness to go out in the outback. It's Maybe it's a, a, something of a stereotype, but it's... It's a very good stereotype, I think. So it's fascinating that you grew up feeling that way as well. Yeah, well, I think um, a lot of Australian kids, we're really lucky here because we have um, a lot of parkland and bushland available to us. So um, where I used to live, I would just walk across the road and we would have this beautiful nature park um, that went through kind of different um, types of forest. So it had like a wetland area and like a eucalyptus forest and a paperback forest in it, um, all in this beautiful walking track. And as you can imagine, if you're walking through there, you're seeing things like red belly black snakes and different kinds of spiders. So for a kid that loves nature, that was absolutely the best place to be. Wow. West Coast or East Coast? Uh, East Coast. East Coast. Okay. I did a trip once. I was in Sydney once and I did a trip all up the West Coast in Perth and all the way yep, up. And yep. I have never seen so much nothing in all of my life. It's <laughs> truly shocking. I had a cell phone. It didn't work. Though, right? It's gorgeous nothing. It's like being on an alien planet. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I had a cell phone. I got five minutes outside of Perth and that phone didn't work again for the next several days. You know it, what? It's um, wild. We're located in Sydney and there's often times where we have no cell phone <laughs> service as well. So it's, it's an ongoing problem in Australia. Yeah. And I remember driving and just 
having to drive with a full tank of gas and trying to get yeah. to the next quote unquote town and the gas being on empty in the camper van as I pulled into this town and it was just a house with a family <laughs> and a gas pump. Yeah. And I thought if you weren't there, we'd be so screwed because we have no backup plan. We have no way of contacting anybody. So it's yep. it's an adventure for sure. And I guess that closeness with nature is something that you just don't have in a lot of other places on Earth. Yeah, I think so. And normally when you're, traveling, when you're traveling in the outback like you are, normally you need to take like a satellite phone with you instead of um, like your regular mobile phone. Um, and you would need to as well take extra cans of petrol just in case you didn't actually make it to the next place that had petrol. Or what if you got to the next place and they had run out of petrol? Then Do you, know you how would have <laughs> been screwed, right? Do you know how many hours I was in the car thinking about that as my hands <laughs> gripped the steering wheel? I was, what if? What if? What if? No, we were very stupid, obviously. Very foolish college students, but uh, <laughs> all of your points are well taken. Um, okay, so how did it start to come about that you came up with the idea to incorporate insects as a food source? Where did that begin? Yeah, so it's kind of a long story, but um, just kind of the shorter version. So I was actually working as a food scientist in a pet manufacturing company, um, and I started my own business, my own education business. So um, in that business, we'll go to schools and teach kids all about um, insects. So things like butterflies and giant cockroaches and all those kinds of things, right? So it fits in with the school curriculum here in Australia because that's something that is um, something that all the kids will learn about. Um, and we had just come back from Thailand and we had tried insect protein there for the very first time. So I had some um, some really big uh, field crickets. They had chilli and garlic on them and they were disgusting, to, to tell you the truth, when I <laughs> bit it, it like exploded with all this oil. It was way too much chili for me. Um, but then next to it, they actually had some bamboo worms and the bamboo worms had a little bit of ginger on them and some lemongrass. And I tried those. They had kind of the texture of um, rice bubbles to them. And I really liked the lemongrass flavoring. So it kind of just showed me that um, eating insects can be really interesting, but it's just like a steak. Like you can cook it really badly and it can taste bad or depending how prepared, then it can taste really good. So for my education company, we're actually doing this expo and I was looking for something unique um, to kind of draw people over to our stand. And I grabbed my little brother and we actually made a thousand of these lollipops that had real bugs on the inside. So they had crickets and mealworms and scorpions and ants and things like that. Um, and we sold out within a couple of hours, which was really amazing. But the weeks after, I was actually getting calls from the newspaper, marketing companies, lolly shops that all wanted to stock these edible insect lollipops. Um, and being a food scientist, there was no information about the nutritional content of these kinds of foods. So sure. I sent away some crickets and mealworms for nutritional testing in a food laboratory. Um, and when I got the results back, I was actually shocked that no one was eating them as a source of food. They were just so nutrient dense. So it was kind of at that time that I felt I had the perfect combination of skills to convince people that this was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and our business has kind of just grown from there. So when we first started, um, we started doing lollipops, chocolate coated bugs, more kind of novel things um, because the market it wasn't ready for the kinds of products that we have now but as the market has changed over time and we've educated the market about all these amazing benefits as insects as a source of food um, now we actually have insect protein products on supermarket shelves in Australia which is fantastic that's so cool and is that you're doing or are there other companies is it a whole movement um, yeah, so we're, we're Australia's largest insect protein farm. So we started farming them in 2007, so quite a long time ago now. Um, so our products are on shelves at the moment. We have a few smaller farms that have just started to come up um, that are starting their own um, edible insect food brands as well, which is really amazing. Um, and we're seeing consumers' perception kind of change over time. So when we first started doing this, obviously there's a little bit of more of a stigma attached around insect protein. And if we were doing like a food expo or something like that, there was this huge force field around us. Like people didn't want to come and engage with us because they didn't know what we were doing. They didn't really understand. Um, now we actually get invited to come to all these amazing events. So things like um, 
the Sydney Royal Easter Show, which is like one of the biggest consumer-based shows here in Australia. They get millions of people to come through um, in a couple of weeks. And they invited us to come and do cooking demos about insect proteins, which is amazing. So now we have people come up to us and they've heard about what we do. They've heard about insect proteins, how sustainable they are, how nutrient dense they are, and they want to learn more and they want to try them. Incredible. You know, it calls to mind. Did you ever watch the show Chef's Table? Do you know that show? I love it. Yep, yep. One of my favorite shows, and one of the guys was a chef from Brazil and in the Amazonas region, and he talks about eating a kind of ant, and he brings it to his restaurant, and he tastes, like you said, a lemongrass taste when you said you were in Thailand. And he thought that they added lemongrass to the ant, but it turned out that the ant itself had a powerful lemongrass taste because of what it ate. Uh, So you must be well aware of all of those kinds of things that these flavor profiles, maybe that worm that you had wasn't, maybe there was no lemongrass added to it at all. Yeah. And you know what? Different. We work a lot with um, a lot of the chefs here in Australia in Australia's top restaurants to supply them with different kinds of um, insects with different flavor profiles. So if you've got something like a cricket, a cricket has like a mild almondy kind of flavor to it, but it's kind of like tofu. So it absorbs the flavors that are around it. So if you're adding it to something, it kind of hides hides on the inside if that makes sense um if you've got something more like a mealworm they have more of like a walnutty kind of oily aftertaste to them um and they've got the texture of rice bubbles which is really cool so i actually make um like a chop i don't know if you guys know what chocolate crackles are <laughs> we make them I, in australia i don't so, but i think i can imagine what it is is it so like a rice crispy with chocolate yeah, it's kind or- of like rice crispy with chocolate but no marshmallows yeah. in it i assume right. rice crispy have marshmallows yeah um so make kind of like one of those but with um a mixture of the rice bubbles and mealworms in them which is really cool and then you have ants and ants have completely different flavor profiles depending on what kind of ant it is so we're actually doing an event where we're making an ant and guava ice cream and we taste tested like 10 different kinds of ants so we could get (laughs) the right kind of flavor profile to go in with the ice cream that we were making Um, and they can have like a lemony flavor or like a woody flavor or even like a strawberry kind of flavor to them so cool So outrageous. All right. Before we get into the founding of the business itself, I've got to know, can you explain a little bit about what food science is in general for the ignorant among us, namely me? You know what? We were talking about this the other day. So food science is actually a really awesome career. And there's so many different things that you can do in food science. So um, there's a lot of maths involved, um, engineering, um, chemistry as well, food process engineering. um, And there's so many different careers in food science. So it's really, really hard to describe it very succinctly because there's so many different things that you can do. But there's so much science that goes behind food. And to make your favourite food, Food that you would eat all the time anyway. Um, so let's try and think of maybe like an Oreo, the science that goes behind making an Oreo, um, the maths that goes behind making an Oreo and making each individual Oreo exactly the same every single time and make a million of them um, is absolutely amazing. So if you're looking for a new career, a career in food science is very diverse. <laughs> so you send these things off. You have no idea what you're about to uncover with this. You send it off to the lab. It comes back and you say, wow, there's something here. What were the results that you found that were so encouraging or exciting or surprising? Yeah. So, um, the, So we sent away a cricket protein powder. So the cricket protein powder was 68% digestible protein. So we actually have enzymes in our guts that are there to digest the types of proteins that are found in insects. Um, It had four times as much calcium as cow's milk, three times as much iron as spinach, three times the amount of omega-3 as salmon in there. It was super high in B12. It had all nine essential amino acids um, and all these essential micronutrients as well. So things like phosphorus, potassium, and zinc and magnesium and manganese so really it had everything that your body needs it had it was low in fat um, and low in carbs as well um, in this tiny little package and it was all natural which is a bonus you know what I mean we don't need to add any chemicals into the food because we can naturally get everything our body needs from all these proteins and micronutrients that are found in the insects so good So how has the response been? Obviously, a lot of vegetarian people, this is something that I'm very curious about. How has the response been from vegetarian or vegan people to this product? Are there any that would say that they would make an exception for this specifically? 
Um, yeah, definitely. So it really depends why you're vegetarian or vegan. So what your reasons are behind it. But we are finding that um, a lot of vegetarians and vegans that are that way because of environmental or ethical reasons will definitely look at adding insect proteins as a source of protein in their diet because often they're missing out on the B12s and they're getting the B12s from unnatural sources. Um, so if they include the insect proteins in their diet, it's actually better for their bodies and it's better environmental mentally for their diet as well. And does it have any of those adverse health effects? Like we know that consuming red meat is very bad. It can cause all kinds of like colon cancer, those sorts of things. Does do insects have any of that associated with them or are they better somehow and why? No, so um in evolution people were actually hunter-gatherers. So insects were part of our natural diet before we were able to commercialise agriculture. So as we commercialised agriculture, insects kind of fell out of our diet because it wasn't something that we could farm kind of on a commercial scale. Um, now that we're able to do that, it's fantastic because we can include insects as part of a balanced diet. So we wouldn't be telling people that, you know, eat insects is your only source of protein. We're looking at this more as a holistic approach where, you know, you can have a a little bit of red meat you can eat other sources of proteins including plant proteins or um, proteins made from algae and seaweed and things like that but insect proteins are definitely a piece of the puzzle that you should be including mm -hmm. and have people been receiving this well like you said it's popular it's becoming it's sold in australian stores now are people coming around i feel like here not it hasn't happened quite yet but i still feel like it will happen eventually yeah, well, in Australia, I feel like we are very open-minded when it comes to food. So a lot of the foods that we get um, come from other countries and um, other places, which is fantastic. So like in the 1980s, we didn't have sushi here in Australia. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So right. um, that wasn't that long ago. Um, so I feel like, um, yeah, definitely people are looking for, you know, um, more flexitarian diets where they're looking for natural, healthy, local foods. And insect proteins really ticks all the boxes for people. And once they realize that you don't have to be eating um, all the legs and wings and antennas that you would expect when you're eating insect proteins, it's something that they can definitely include in their diet all the time. Yeah. So describe to me, were you pulled into creating this business, would you say? Were you just encouraged you made those lollipops and it, people asked you, were you pulled into doing it? more than you pushed the idea outward? Um, yeah, I feel like the demand was uh, really there for education around this. So when we first started, as I said, we started as an education business. So as soon as I learned about um, the amazing benefits of insect proteins, I actually included a program called Future Food in our school program. So we run that from preschools all the way up to universities. Like I go and lecture at universities for their um, animal science students and food science students now. Um, and in the past 15 years, I've actually seen over 1.3 million students come through that program. Program. Um, and all of those people actually have a better understanding of our food system than their parents and their grandparents did. Um, so now I was actually um, not that long ago in the supermarket and I've got three little kids and this grown man came up to me and he's like, hey, are you that bug lady? And I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> stay away from my children. Right. And he wanted to explain that um, when he was uh, in year five or six, which he would have been like 10 or 11 years old, I went to his school and taught him all about edible insects and the future of food and our food system and that kind of really stuck with him and um he includes insects in his diet because he really believes in it too and mm -hmm. I literally nearly burst into tears and fell on the floor I was just so happy because when you go and you speak to children you don't know if they're taking in what you're saying or if you've made an impact on them and even if you know one out of every session of kids grows up to have a better understanding of our food system and take something away from that that's actually making a huge difference that's so validating and you probably have this vision that you've taught all of these people and you think I've done all of this work but you don't know if you're really making a difference. You you kind yeah. of know that you are, but you don't directly know that you are until somebody yeah. says... It stuck and with me. You know what? Um, when we go into schools, one of the first questions that I ask the class is who has tried edible insects before? And normally you would get one or two kids put their hand up. Maybe the teacher's been to Thailand or something like that, or they've been to one of the restaurants that we supply before. And I went to this school at Bondi um, last year and... 
I asked the same question and about 40 out of 80 kids had put up their hands and I thought they misheard the what I was saying, like the question. So I went to repeat it and the teacher started laughing and they said, oh, no, they all have cricket, protein, corn chips in their lunchbox for school instead of sandwiches because the shop across the road actually sold them in, in the shop. So that just made me feel so good because all of these kids are eating that every day for their lunch instead of having a sandwich that might not have um, as much nutritional value for them. Incredible. That's so incredible that this whole movement is happening and you're such a big part of it. I'm blown away. So (laughs) on the business side, you sell a lot of products now. How did you start expanding your product range? You've got quite an impressive array of different things. Yeah, so um, we actually, uh, as we did events, every time we did a special event, we'll kind of trial a new product. Um, We've had a website and we sell a lot of products through our website and that's a fantastic opportunity for us because we felt that retailers weren't ready for our kind of products yet, but there was a lot of people that wanted them. So we offered them through our website, we offered them at special events and it gave us the opportunity to listen to customer feedback um, and find out what they wanted and how they could include insect proteins um, in their diet in a like a really, really easy way. So um, over, you know, the past 15 years, we've kind of collected all these really awesome recipes. We have our own food manufacturing facility um, and farm that's together. So all of our products we make on our own site. Um, So we kind of feel that, Um, Like our cricket protein corn chips is fantastic because it's kind of a ready to eat product. You don't have to learn how to use insect protein. It's a product that already has it in there for you. Um, And things like uh, we've got a lemon myrtle and saffron pasta. So instead of having your regular white pasta, you can just swap it and have a high protein, high calcium pasta. And it looks and tastes the same as you would expect. Um, Or even like a granola for breakfast in the morning. And um, it has half of your daily iron intake in that little scoop of granola. So um, kind of looking at foods that um, people already eat anyway, and we're just enriching them with like our special invisible little ingredients. Yeah. And I think as somebody who was, uh, I was a hardcore vegan for a couple of years, and then I had to lax a bit. I found it very difficult practically to keep it up. And I was living in Europe at the time. It's just very difficult from a practical standpoint, living in the world and getting the nutrition that you need. You have to be educated and you have to know what you're doing. And I think the idea of swapping something out for something yeah. better or more, that's such a powerful concept because we know yeah. that a lot of these things that we eat are just filler or just junk. Or you say the pasta is good, but I don't want just empty carbs. So anything that you can swap with something that's better is is really good in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I think it's think huge. That- You know, when you normally have your regular bag of corn chips um, and then you eat that whole bag bag of corn chips. Right. And then feel terrible. Yes. And then afterwards you feel like, you know what, I could have another bag of those corn chips. Easily. Because it didn't actually give your body any kind of nutrition. So that was the problem. But if you eat a bag of the corn chips that are made using the cricket protein powder, that little 50 gram bag has more protein than an egg in there. It's got 14% of your RDI of B12. It's got heaps of your iron as well. And it's got magnesium and magnesium stops you getting sugar cravings as well as the amino acids. So when you're eating that, your body actually feels really satisfied afterwards and it's stops you wanting to snack again. So looking at things like that, where you are getting the the kind of snack that you want, because you still want that crunchy, salty snack, but it's giving your body nutrition. I think that's the key to these kinds of um, new foods and alternative proteins. Well, I hope you realize that you've made a tremendous mistake, a horrible mistake, because the whole point of being a food scientist is to make me not satisfied, to make me eat that second bag of chips (laughs) to make me constantly crave more unhealthy food. If you're going to stop that, it that's, goes against everything in the food scientist handbook. No, it doesn't because food scientists aren't evil geniuses, okay? They want people to have healthy lives. They want people to eat nutrient-dense foods and they want people to eat sustainably because we um, are all really focused on our planet at the moment. So looking at these new kinds of foods that are coming out, eating more flexitarian diets and plant-based diets um, is definitely something that food scientists are pushing towards. Well, that's a very diplomatic answer. And obviously, I was just kidding, of course. Uh, Tell us a little bit about the difference in the amount of resources required to make protein from insects versus any other means. What are some stats you can list off or rough ballpark? 
So we actually farm our insects indoors. So we convert unused warehouse spaces into insect protein farms, which means that we can stack, we can control the temperature and humidity, but we can actually stack um, our specially designed enclosures on top of each other. So that means that we're using the space really efficiently. We're not taking up any farmland to be able to feed them as well. Um, we actually circle fruit and vegetable waste that would normally go to landfill back into our food system as feed for our insects as well. So that means means that if you replace just one meat-based meal a week with a meal that uses crickets as your source of protein instead, you actually save over 100,000 litres of drinking water a year. So that's about four swimming pools full of water. Um, we create one one hundredth of the amount of greenhouse gases. We run on 80% solar at the moment, but we're moving into a larger farm. So we'll be running on 100% solar very shortly. Um, and because insects are mammals like us, they don't waste a lot of, temp uh, a lot of energy maintaining a set body temperature they're a little bit more go with the flow so all, nearly all of what they eat gets converted directly into body mass so if you've got um, 10 kilos of feed you can produce about one kilo of beef or you can produce nine kilos of cricket protein Wow. Um, and life cycle is actually a heap shorter as well. So um, if you, um, for you to get uh, beef to a stage where you would be able to eat it, it takes about 18 months. Um, to get the crickets to a stage where you would harvest them, it only takes about six weeks. And then in that six weeks, we can make powders, oils, paste, even like a milk kind of product out of the crickets. And then it can be added to the foods that you already like. That's just phenomenal. I mean, and it, it makes sense because I've often thought, Anybody who's thinking about becoming a vegetarian or changing their food or diet in any way, you have to ask yourself, and certainly here in the United States, you can buy a pound of chicken for roughly the same price, or let's say a pound of beef for roughly the same price you can buy a pound of corn. And yeah. knowing how many thousands of pounds of corn and other grain that a cow has to eat to produce that pound of beef, it's easy to see that there's just no way that there's a balance there, that the amount of yeah, resources exactly. that go into that are clearly insane, but through subsidies and this weird accounting and weird government intervention, nobody really knows how that works. And I think it's deliberately obscured from the end consumer. Part of that's a good thing, keeping prices low for everybody. But part of it is we have no concept of how wasteful these products are. And there's really no indication on the packaging of how much water went into it or how much other resources had to go into making it, right? Yeah, and you know what? We've got a lot of farmers here in Australia that are doing amazing things with traditional kinds of agriculture at the moment. So they're looking more towards regenerative farming, I which um, is fantastic. Yeah, because it it's means amazing. that... Um, we can still produce those traditional forms of livestock, but it's in a much more sustainable way. So when we're looking at the future of farming, those are kinds of the things that you'll be seeing. We'll be moving away from more industrialised agriculture and moving more towards these um, regenerative farming techniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any drawback that you can see? Is there anything? Could this scale all the way? Could insect protein replace all meat protein, in your opinion, or no? Um, it could, but you know what, there's always going to be that internal kind of ick factor when it comes to bugs. So it's not going to be for everybody. And we believe in having, um, like a whole diet. So not just one source of protein. Um, so that includes, um, uh, like meat and fish and plants as well. Um, different kinds of legumes and nuts. They're all part of our um, future food system. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like we'll be moving more to more towards, um, cellular based agriculture, um, and away from these traditional traditional farms um, because eventually those will be a more sustainable option and then um, the animal welfare aspect of it is taken out. That's very exciting too. But you said always, and you also said earlier in 1980 that Australians and also Americans thought sushi would always have the ick factor. So I'm not so sure yeah. it'll always have the ick factor, especially if the food tastes delicious. If and you get you it in what? people's hearts and minds, why, why should it? Yeah, you kind of have to think of it just as an ingredient. So when you think about eating jelly, like I know that Americans like jelly, right? You don't think, oh, I'm eating the boiled skins and hooves, hooves of cows yeah. and pigs because that's what gelatin is. You just no. think of gelatin as an ingredient. When we're looking at the future of food and insect proteins as part of that, we're looking at insect proteins as just an ingredient. It's just a food. It's not something that's weird or strange or novel or unusual. It's just going to be food. Just crunch patties. That's all you need to know. <laughs> it's a delicious crunch. I don't know what that is. <laughs> exactly. It, but it sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I, I think it's easy to see that it'll become normalized. So for yeah, people- and, and it's well, it's well in its way. So there's lots of countries around the world that are um, uh, putting regulations around the sale of insect-based food. So in Australia, we actually did that in 2015. Um, they were moved from the novel food register. So now they just have the same kinds of standards as anything else you'll purchase in the supermarket. So as other countries kind of follow suit, you'll definitely be seeing more kinds of um, insect protein products available on shelves. So you've received a bunch of accolades. You've received a bunch of awards. How does that feel? Does does that change anything? Do you care about external recognition like that? I don't really care about external recognition, but for us, it's really fantastic because um, it kind of helps to cement our place as experts in our area. So we've got awards for like education and sustainability and, um, you know, different all different kinds of awards, like those kinds of things, which is fantastic because then people can go on our website and they can see all of these different things that have been, you know, assessed by external people that are not within our company and then have said, oh, you know what, you're doing a really good job. So um, it kind of helps us um, validate our business a little bit to new customers that are coming in. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes sense. And you can explain it and you can overcome that first hurdle, which is why should I trust this? And I'm scared for newbies. But you're covering that with the kids are fine because they understand. But it's those people who are just saying, I don't know about this. You're saying, look, it's legitimate. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, disgust is one of the only learnt behaviours. So a uh, learnt emotion, sorry. So we grow up knowing how to be happy and sad and angry and all that kind of stuff. But we learn disgust from the people that are around us. So that's why we kind of focus on um, uh, educating students at a really young age because we can get to them before they've developed that disgust behaviour, that disgust reaction to insect based um, foods and they actually they're fantastic advocates for us because they go away and they tell their parents and they tell their grandparents about it and then um, those adults are then coming back to our website to learn a little bit more because they want to talk about it with their kids. Disgust is one of the only learned I did not know that and that is a mind-blowing fact Yep. in itself. But when you think about it though it makes sense right? It does and there are so many implications of that far beyond this yeah but wow it's a learned behavior that's a study that said that you've read that that's that's uh, just, yeah so if I'm you just google it yeah so it's called um it's a learned emotion so if you google it it's got lots of university studies and things like that about incredible. it incredible okay that'll be my next little wikipedia rabbit hole yeah <laughs> i'm gonna go down that one and figure that oh it turns out all of these things yeah so many implications for that uh, all right. So the next five years, the next couple years, what do you see happening? If everything goes amazingly beyond your wildest dreams, what does outrageous success look like from here forward? Oh, really outrageous success. So um, Best case scenario. Some of the little wins that we're having at the moment. So we're um, we're rolling out our cricket protein corn chips into school canteens, about 6,000 school canteens in Australia at the moment, which is very exciting for us because we've developed that product specifically for children. Um, and then um, kind of in the next five years, we will be um, moving our brand of insect proteins offshore, so away from Australia, and we'll be establishing cricket protein, cricket protein farms in key locations around the world. So that we can supply local food to local communities using their local food waste stream because there's no point in us making this super sustainable product and then shipping it all over the world. That just doesn't make sense to us. Mm. Um, so we'll be um, establishing our farms in different locations depending on where there's need. Do you think, is the U.S. one of those places? Do you have yeah, any definitely. Okay. It's a huge market for us. That would be insane. Do you have any concrete plans or is that just a potential... Uh, so we're actually at the moment we're moving into a larger farm here in Australia and we're implementing, we've developed robotics and artificial intelligence that help us like feed, clean and monitor the insects so we can bring down the cost of our production processes. Once we've kind of got that all down pat and everything's running nice and smoothly, then we'll be moving forward with plans um, for different different continents. You can have the last word. Do you want to promote anything? Do you want to share anything? What action you want people to take? I leave the closing of this episode entirely to you to say whatever you like. 
Oh, so I feel like um, everybody thinks that they have to be doing really big things to make a big difference. But, you know, if everybody is taking a straw instead of, um, you know, a, a plastic straw instead of a paper straw, then there's millions and millions of plastic straws that end up in landfill. So what you can actually do is you can make little choices for yourself. Um, it doesn't have to be big. It can be one or two things a month that you can do. Um, and all these really add up to make a big difference. So we need people um, not eating perfectly sustainable, but eating imperfectly sustainably, if that makes sense. <laughs> it does. It does. Well, I can think of no better way to wrap it up there. So again, Sky, thank you very much for taking the time. And uh, with that, the official podcast is over. 